Ooh wee. We have ourselves here, the beginnings of a roll cage, don't we? Hey, hey, back at it with another full day on the Z cart. Just had a bunch of new subscribers and likes and all that stuff on the YouTube channel, so that's awesome. Big shout out to Jeremy at Faster Proms for sending a lot of people that way and putting this card in his video. It's sweet to, uh, to get that support and I'm glad you guys have found this because we are doing the cage. We're starting the cage. To show you what I'm working with with the rear enforce reinforcement. So here is the part, a very strong part of the car. So here we have this vertical uh, boxed in part of the frame. This is directly over the rear spring perch. And this is obviously the shock tower mount. So what I decided to do was I just took this eighth inch plate and we we're just gonna box this all in and just make this nice and beefy and structural. So I made templates out of cardboard. I bent this up and this is going to fit something along those lines. So it'll be welded all to the strut tower. It'll be welded all along here, boxed in and also tied into the top of this. So this is where I'm gonna land my rear, my rear roll bar uh, mounts. I'm doing the opposite on the other side. As you can see, before bending, you know, these are just my eighth inch plates. We're gonna mark them up and bend them, and we'll make the other side match, and I will get these welded on today. Reinforce, what, I think what we've already been over, this rear differential mount is going to be reinforced too. These are kind of weak points. So I just picked up two more tubing dies. I picked up a one inch die and an inch and a quarter. So now I have a lot more flexibility to bend smaller diameter tubing. So we can save weight and we can mix in a bunch of smaller stuff that's not as essential as the main structure of the roll cage. And it's just gonna be awesome to, to have that opportunity. We'll, you know, we'll probably reinforce the harness bar with some one inch or inch and a quarter. I want to come through, I think the dash here to the strut towers with maybe some inch and a quarter two. And it's all gonna be DOM. And we're just gonna keep doing that kind of stuff. We are at the point now where we are ready to weld these on. On this cage, I think I'm gonna do a lot of TIG welding. Uh, I'm gonna TIG weld all these joints here. I'm gonna TIG weld all the cage just for a nice clean look. It doesn't have to be that way. MIG welding will work just as fine, but I think on things like that, I'm gonna do that. I will MIG weld it to the body just because the body's dirty and it will definitely, it'll be an issue if you try TIG welding that for sure. So just so you guys see how I clean up the metal, what I do is I go and just trace it. So I have my plate in there. And then what I do is I trace with a Sharpie, you know, just all around the edge. And then what I like to do is just take this die grinder with a, uh, this is just a, you know, generic uh, deburring tool. And I just go and do about, I don't know, try to do like an inch right along that line. And it cleans up the paint and undercoat and all that stuff away from your weld, which is obviously what you want. It will catch on fire in the backside and it's stinky. And it's one of those deals that you just kind of have to deal with it. Make sure you have good ventilation when you do it because there's no fun way about this. It just, it stinks and it's a mess and it sucks. Then we'll put it in the car and we just have a nice, you know, we you try to get as tight as possible. You'll see there's a little gap like right here, not even a quarter inch, maybe three sixteenths. We'll be able to fill that in no problem. You can also, on a situation like this from the backside, you can kind of tap it in to close that gap a little bit. You naturally want tight as gaps as possible, but as you can see in these bodies, there's all sorts of uh, bends and dimples and all sorts of stuff. So you'd really just do the best you can at, at certain points. Well, we just finished up these rear box reinforcement, uh, just TIG welded. TIG welded the top there. Like I said, these are this all, whole area that is connected to the car. We're gonna MIG weld that. So I'll let you guys know what I'm using for a TIG I or a TIG rod. I'm using ER80 116th filler rod. And 
I am using on this 332 2% thoriated tungsten. So that's just what I'm using, 100% argon. And that's what we get. So we'll, uh, we'll let these cool off. I'm gonna grab a bite for lunch and we'll get them welded onto the car. Well, here's our setup. See, I got our battery and I got our tank. And what I did was I found the, uh, the feed line. So the, we're just running right now, we're just running power right to the, directly to the pump. So the pump's just on once we hit the battery. And this is the feed line and the bottom one here is the return line. Now I tested the return line just cause I was curious about flow and whatnot. As you should be able to see here, we got a pretty good stream coming out. Now I can actually smell the fuel. It actually smells kind of bad. Um, but we got a pretty good stream coming out there. But I also tested the return line. So initially I plugged this up and went with the return line as the feed. And it's about half the flow. Okay. Yeah, we just ran out of fuel. Okay, great. So I pumped all this out. I was just pumping. That's about five gallons. So there's about, ooh, geez, I'd say this halfway. So there's about eight gallons of fuel that was in here. So I'm gonna disconnect this now. So our pump's off and we'll just let things kind of settle back down. But what I was saying was this return line was flowing about half the amount of fuel, I would say, as the feed, which leads me to think that the fuel filter is probably clogged or there's some sort of obstruction in the path from here to the injectors back to the fuel tank. So the most logical thing would be the, the fuel filter. So I'm gonna order one of those up. It's something we'll wanna replace anyways, not a big deal because the amount of fuel coming back was really bad. That would explain the breaking up issue too. If we're not getting the right fuel pressure, it's gonna act weird. It's gonna go on and off and do all sorts of strange things. So we have that. Also, now that it's empty, I'm going to install, I had this laying around for my S5040 30. This was an original lifter pump that I switched to a fuel cell and a different setup, but this is a, uh, like I just said, this is a Walbra 450. So we're gonna throw this in there. This should supply plenty of fuel to the system. And it's nice because I have it laying around and it's genuine. Side note, be really careful when you buy these. Um, you find them on eBay and Amazon, they're all over the place. A lot of them are counterfeits. Same with the 255s. If it's the price is too good to be true, it more likely is. I buy all of these uh, Walbros, and if I have to buy Bosch, or I'm sorry, Walbro 255s, 450s, whatever size, I buy them from like Summit Racing because you know they have a legit source and it's all good. But I've heard some of the Chinese Chinese ones work, and they'll be okay. But for the extra 50 bucks or whatever it is for the legit one, it's worth having that peace of mind and you know it's gonna be all legit stuff. So we just got this pumped out and there is a little spillage. So I'm gonna clean that up, kind of let it evaporate. And then we'll get back welding in about, I don't know, say half an hour or so. Well, we just finished up the rear boxing in the rear strut towers and everything's looking great. So we got these all in here. Uh, I only burnt through in a couple really small spots and nothing to worry about. Everything went pretty good. So at this point, there's a couple things that I want to start thinking about. First is before I get my rear down tubes uh, set, I think I want to do my front A pillar. And I want to do that because I wanna make sure this line looks proper, right? I wanna make sure it comes off the windscreen and is all level pretty much. Cause like I was saying, I do wanna do a, some sort of hard top that's removable with either a roof scoop or, or side scoops or something to cool either one radiator or two small radiators on either side. So I wanna make sure that is a good 
you know, just looks good. It's not, as of right now, it looks like it's sticking up high because the windshield is bowed, right? But if you put a level on the center from here to here, it's flush. So I just want to make sure because the tube, I was planning on having it come and come down almost on the outside of it and then straight down through here. So I'm going to cut this out, right? And right now I'm just going to cut a little window and then mount that. Now, ultimately, and this is going to be really neat, I want to cut this whole section out. So this whole section is going to get cut out. And then I want to do a piece of poly in here so you can see right through, right? So on the inside, you have a piece of poly riveted, but you can see your feet and stuff. And, you know, on the driver's side, obviously match it. So I think that will be really neat. But what's really important now is that and what i have to take into consideration is not cutting too much off at once because we don't want this chassis to move around being convertible we got these huge uh sills which is great and you know the thing's designed not to have a top on it so like when we were driving around the other day and uh at jeremy's shop that was no big deal like i literally did nothing but cut the rear arches off a little bit and cut the rear bumper off. So that wasn't a big deal. It's not gonna, that's not gonna twist the car or anything. The car's designed, you know, strong enough where all that stuff is gonna be fine. But now once we get into the weeds of this stuff, we have to start taking that in consideration. You know, if you have a uh, car that's not a convertible, let's say just a E36 with a roof, right? And if you cut the roof off, you have to really consider that chassis flexing and making supports and stuff. So, and then on this part, let me grab a piece of tube. Whew, that's a great sound. Or I picked up an inch and an eighth, or I'm sorry, inch and a quarter die. Um, what was it? Two days ago. Okay. So I have a die that now I can bend inch and a quarter tubing. This is DOM tubing. And I also picked up a one inch die. So this being inch and a quarter, what I'm thinking of doing is using the smaller diameter tubing and framing out this back section. So this will span in between the strut bars, right? And then I'm thinking, have it come down. I only got one hand here, but we'll get the idea. So have it come down like this weld a plate to like here and here let's say that will support the differential mount which is right here in the this cross um, member so we'll bend it come down back up here weld it back to here and this, so you have two tubes two inch and a quarter tubes one straight across one there and then i got a bunch of dimple dies i want to play with and i was thinking about doing some really neat just it's gonna be the front and center. You know, if you're behind the car, it's what you're gonna look at. So we do some pretty cool like dimple die patterns to connect the two. And um, I think that'll look pretty pretty slick. And it'll also save, save weight and add rigidity. And that's just instead of doing, you know, a big uh, um, inch and three quarter DOM tubing, you know, one, one side to one side, it's kind of overkill and it's really not necessary. So I think we'll jazz it up a little bit with that. But right now, we are looking really good. This, these, these plates came out good. Oh, another thing I wanted to note. Um, what I had was eighth inch plate by six inches. So these are six inch tall frames essentially. And some, I'm not sure about Z3s. This stuff is super thick, so I'm really not, well, I shouldn't say super thick, but it's not just your generic sheet metal. This is uh, you know thicker than normal. And on E30s, sometimes you'll have these shock towers fail and these will actually punch right through the top. I don't think that's gonna be the case here. If I feel inclined, I could gusset it you know, with some just triangle gussets here, here, and here to kind of support this, but I really don't think this is going anywhere and it's gonna be any kind of concern. All right, we got some work done here. So now I started cutting the A-pillar bar. So we're gonna come from here down to here. Now, I started cutting this in small sections and I really wish I had a plasma cutter at this point in time. I've been on the fence about buying one. It's one of those deals where something like this, it's awesome, but I really don't do this stuff all the time. And for a nice one, they're like two grand, pretty much is what I'd be looking to spend. For um, And if I'm gonna get a plasma, I'm gonna get a uh, Hypertherm 45 XP. They're awesome units. 
So that's what I've been looking at. I've just been kind of one of those things, every time I'm ready to pull the trigger on it, I'm like, uh, I don't know, two grand is, you know, it's just one of those deals. So right now we're getting weird with Sawzalls and it kind of sucks, but hey, you gotta deal with the cards you're dealt. And right now we're in it. So as you can see, this is our main frame channel, more or less, on the car. So this is a very structural component. This point here actually ties in to the jack point. So my idea is we're going to create a U-shaped bracket, very similar to that, out of eighth inch. And we're going to just pretty much weld it, you know, bend it and weld it here. And that will allow us to create our A-pillar. So this, I'll bend it. And right now, I just like to do things like this as a visual. I'm not sure if I want it here or here. The more I look at it, the more sleek it would be here. And then I can add some gussets up there. And I think that might look pretty trick. But once this is in, this A-pillar bar, then I can start adding door bars and this and that and we'll just keep removing material as we go. And now removing this material will allow us to save weight, obviously. Well, we're not really saving weight, we're equalizing weight. So this tube is, I don't know, looks like three and a half feet. And I think DOM 95,000, so was 1.79 pounds per foot. So let's call that five pound piece, right? So we're gonna cut out, I don't know, three pounds. So that's my goal is to not add, you know, I don't wanna leave all this material here. Let me show you how we're gonna set up a bend here. So we have a couple of things. First is this is my 90 degree bend. So on any piece of tubing that I do that I need to bend, I always use this as a reference. So for those two uh, dives I just got, I'm gonna do the same thing for each material. Um, one inch and an inch and a quarter. In this case, this is inch and three quarter by 95 thousandths wall. And this is used so I can judge each and every one of my bends and where I need to initiate the bend. And on this one, we need to figure out where to start the bend to match this profile of the window. So what I'm gonna do, in this case, I'll just take a piece of scrap, and you can use anything, really. Um, you can even just use a tape measure, but this, just for visual, visualization purposes, we'll, we'll do this. And what I'm gonna do is, so I know this bend starts right here. And if I bend it 45 degrees, it will stop there and just continue there. If I had to bend 90 degrees, obviously it'll stop there and go there. But at the minimum degree, I know where it will land, okay? I hope this is making sense because it makes sense to me, but if I'm explaining it wrong, just let me know. Or if you need clarification, I'll definitely be able to help you out. So on this one, I want the tube to essentially stay in line with this lower lip here on this windscreen. I don't want it high. Although I, this is going to be raised up with the plate on it, but it's okay, we'll just be able to trim it afterwards. So what I wanna do is if you look at it, you can actually see where it's gonna lie, right? So if you're looking with me, you can see that right here, if we stop the bend here, which almost looks like about 45 degrees, it will follow this plane up. So with that being said, I'm going to mark this tube right here, okay? And that's where we're going to initiate the bend. Obviously not in this tube, because this tube's too small. Too short, rather. But that gives us 14 inches is where we're gonna start this bend. And now you're wondering, well, what do we bend it to? What, what degree? And that's unknown in this situation. But what I made is this simple tool. It's just a bolt with a wing nut and two 
pieces of, I think this is three quarter inch by three sixteenths. And it, this just acts as a very simple angle finder. So what I do, and this is all approximate, you know, right now. And this is just for visualization purposes. And what I'll do is go like this. Okay, all right. So that looks about 90. Bam, right there. So that is what we're gonna bend it to. And now when I bend it, I will generally under bend it because you can always go back once you mark it and bend it a little bit more. And now what I am achieving or trying to achieve is 90. So I bent this at the 14 uh, inches like we talked about. And I wanna keep it right in line with this or the best we can. We're not gonna get crazy here. We're not gonna split hairs. And I'm good with like, you know, within one, 1 1.5 degree or whatever, it's not a huge deal. So right now we're at 1.8. Yeah, so we're at 0. 0.75 degrees. So we're really in the neighborhood here. So I'm totally cool with that. We're pretty much 90 degree from here. So I'm okay with that bend. And now we're gonna start the second bend, which gets a little interesting because we actually have to bend the tube this way. So I'm gonna make a mark on it right in plane with here. And we're gonna bend going that way using the same principles as we did before. Well, this piece is ready for notching now. So it's a little far forward, as you can see, but it's got that nice profile right down the side. And it lines up right with this tube. I mean, it's a little bit, it could bend like another half degree, but honestly, this stuff, you can ratchet strap it, push it by hand, it'll go. That's, that's nothing we fuss about. Now that this is done, I have all the measurements, I have all the degrees that we bent it to. I think the first one wound up being 60 and this one wound up being 41 degrees. So we're just gonna replicate it and mirror it. And that's the important part, mirroring it. I left it, <laughs> you don't wanna do them the same because then you'll wind up with two of the same part that won't fit. Also on this one here, I'll have to measure the drop piece I cut off. It's still in the, the saw but it was about six inches longer than I wanted. So the next one, I'm gonna leave like maybe two inches. So we'll save a little bit of material. This piece here is six feet. So just so you have an idea, it's just 12 feet of tubing just in these front bars. So you can see how quickly it adds up and at $4 and 17 cents a foot, it's definitely not cheap. So you don't wanna make mistakes if you can avoid it. It's not a big deal if you do. Generally, in a situation like this, you can use them in other applications. I mean, you know, if you've messed up a bend, there's plenty of room for other tubes and plenty of areas for them to go. So, so with that being said, don't sweat. If you mess up a bend, it happens. I do it all the time. I messed up a bend two days ago. I mean, it happens. You're gonna overbend stuff. You're gonna you're gonna cut stuff short. It just happens, and it's not a big deal. I mean, you don't want to make a habit of it, <laughs> especially at four to six bucks a foot, depending on what you're using. But it's something that happens. It's just something you want to practice. And if you are bending and practicing and doing something that's not like on a car, not critical, you can use electric weld tube, which is much, much cheaper. It's like a dollar seventy or two bucks a foot. So if you're just building some kind of buggy or something silly that doesn't need to meet any kind of specifications, you can definitely play around with that stuff. I recommend doing that. Uh, if you're making bumpers, things like that, Jeep stuff, whatever, try playing around with that stuff. It's much cheaper and it's a lot more forgiving. And you know, especially in your wallet, it's more forgiving if you make a mistake. So that's the one. So we're gonna notch that one right there and we're gonna replicate this and hopefully get these front tubes all done tonight. That's my goal. And once you get those front tubes done, it's looking too like this is the right height. So the back tubes are also ready to get going. Well, I got the front place sorted out for the mounting. Now there's a couple things here. This side is all cut out and this all in here 
very structural stuff, very thick material, and they did this in a way that obviously can support no roof. So this is what I decided to make for it. Eighth inch plate, bent it in a U, about, I think it's seven and a quarter inches long. I wanted to go six, but the way it worked out and the, what I had to cut off to achieve getting over our jack point and everything and make it all look proper, that's kind of what it wound up being. I was shooting for six, but kind of, kind of with the rear too. These were seven inches as well. Hey, it doesn't add that much weight, bigger the better, I guess, when it comes to dispersing weight. This one is all in place. So you can see we got nice tight fits here. We're gonna weld all this here. We'll probably just make a little, you know, a little tiny piece just to tie that in. This here is all gonna come off. So this, this will be cut probably right at this little seam here and all this will be gone. For now, I'm just gonna tack it on here. I have my other bar, I just bent that up. It matches the other one. So right now I'm just gonna show you the fitment on the other side. I like to get these things to fit as close as possible. I also like contouring them. You see a lot of guys, they'll just individually plate them. You know, on this, you know, they'll do, this will be one plate, this will be another. And I just think it looks cleaner to do it all like this. Yeah, I just think that looks cleaner like that. But I just wanna show you the kind of fitment I like to do. You know, I get a little, probably a little overkill with how crazy I get with this stuff, but. You can see, oh, I got it crossed up a little bit. There we are. So we got nice tight gaps here. Actually, I wanted to bring this down to this where this body rolls over, so I'm probably just gonna slice this. Oh, just maybe. It's just hung on, up on it just a little bit in this edge. And then, now that I look on this side, I didn't clean enough material down here. So this is why uh, we just test fit them like this, is because obviously I didn't grind off enough material uh, down here to achieve a proper uh, welding surface. So. I'm just gonna buzz that off, grind that back, and I'm gonna tack these on, and then we'll get our two A-pillar tubes tacked in place. We just got these A-pillars tacked into place. And they are coming out awesome. I'm happy with the look so far. And check out this fitment. I don't want to toot my own horn, but beep, beep. So these are just tacked into place for now and everything went great. I copied, I mirrored this tube to the other side. Everything worked out well. I was a little bit short by about a quarter inch on the other side. And let me just show you a trick. I should have filmed it. So I was maybe three eighths to a quarter inch short on this notch because I really wanted to maintain this, get, uh, this tight fit. So what I did here, is actually just tacked it to the body. So this held that in place. And the main hoop was just a little far back. I, I got a little greedy with a notch, but that's no big deal. What I do is I took a ratchet strap and just took the strap from here, strapped it to this point right here, gave it like a half a crank, and that just tightened it right up and that's all I needed. But so far, I mean, this thing is looking, it's gonna look awesome. And it's gonna be safe. That's the most important thing. I, I know it's like a, a cart and stuff. Honestly, guys, I've been going online and looking at other carts that people's built. People have built, especially there's a ton of Miata carts. Uh, there's there's a ton of them. There's actually a company out of I don't know Louisiana or something that builds carts. And I've mo I'd say 95% of them the cages are super dicey. As in. The tubes just terminate to nowhere. There's no real structural thought process behind it. It's like, hey, whatever looks cool. This we're going on kind of a proven design style. Uh, basically, I'm doing a more or less a rally style cage, FIA style cage. I'm not going to get in the weeds with doing 
uh, sill bars and stuff like that because this car really doesn't need it. This car is not going to be racing any sanctioned you know, events where that's going to be really an issue, at least that I know of. But as of, as of right now, this is going to be just fine for what our intent and purpose is with this car. So, like I said, we're not going to be competing with this thing or anything. We're just going to build this to have a good time. I am registering it tomorrow, which is hilarious. So I got all the paperwork done. As of right now, this car is insured. So tomorrow I'll have a license plate for it, which is just funny to me. So <laughs> I'm sure you guys in not free states are asking, how do you do that? Well, it's going to have... I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff down here in Florida, but it's going to have turn signals, has a horn, windshield wipers, proper windscreen. It's going to have brake lights, going to have taillights. It really has all the things you need for it to be safe and legal. It's just not going to have fenders or a roof or doors. It's pretty much like a Jeep, but low to the ground and small and not a Jeep. That's my thought process at least. So we'll see what the uh, local law enforcement says about it, but I'm not too worried. All right, guys, if you don't live in Florida, you probably should. Z cart. Insured, registered, title. Ready to rip the streets of, uh, <laughs> of Tampa Bay area. This is crazy. So $414 later, a little expensive, but I got a plate and I just need to get some lights back on that thing and I can drive it around. So hilarious. Won't be ready for another couple weeks, but right now they're doing a thing where you have to make a appointment. And this was the only appointment I could really get. And I just figured I made it like two or three weeks ago, not knowing where I'd be at with the car. So I'm a little early on it, but hey, whatever. So that's awesome. Can't wait to, uh, can't wait to, well, I'm definitely gonna get pulled over in this car because it doesn't look that legit, but it is according to Florida. Ooh, we. We have ourselves here, the beginnings of a roll cage, don't we? So it is a Thursday morning. And this is where we sit as of today. I'm very excited how this is coming along. It hasn't been the fastest project because I have orders to deal with. I have a baby on the way, so there's nurseries to paint and there is bathrooms to renovate and just owning a home and all that stuff. There's pools to clean and lawns to mow. And so I've been trying to knock out some house projects, but we are looking really good so far. I'm very happy with how this is turning out. The shape, the shape is pretty rad. If you look at it like that, I mean, that's a, that's a good profile in my opinion. So one thing I did do last night was I bought a plasma cutter. That should be in Monday or Tuesday, I think, maybe mid next week sometime. But I'm very excited, I bought a 60 amp unit and I will go over that once it comes in. I'm excited for that because we have to do a lot more cutting on this. We have to cut out this whole dash area. And that's one of the reasons why I bought it. I was like, well, how am I gonna cut all this without getting, you know what I mean? Without jacking up blades and stuff. And it would just suck. So a plasma is gonna make my life so much easier. We'll be able to cut out with precision a lot more of the car. As I was noting, we're gonna have to cut all this out in order to make room for our diagonal bars. So there's just all that that we have to take in consideration. I'm headed over to Jeremy's shop right now. They got a couple Kirky seats that they use on pretty much everything. I know they fit me well, but I wanna confirm the size. And after I confirm the size, I am going to order two seats from Gearhead. And that's a necessary thing because in order for me to do my door tubes, and my harness bar, I need the height of my harnesses. So if anything, today I'll just measure the seats and I can even get started on that this weekend. Well guys, thanks for watching. I got, I don't know, a thousand plus new subscribers after the Faster Proms video that this car is in. So I am super thankful for that. That is so awesome. You guys are awesome. And 
stay tuned for the next video. I have a lot of work to do this weekend, but I'm gonna work as hard as possible on getting this car, just keep on progressing with it and keep on going with it. And this project will not be stalled. So we're gonna keep moving with this thing and it's gonna be awesome. So thank you. Feel free to like, subscribe, hit the notifications bell if you wanna see what we're dealing with next. But see you next time and happy racing, guys.